The Mystical Kabbalah by Dion Fortune. Uh, turns out Dion Fortune is a woman. Uh, I was confused the first time I uh, read this, started reading this book. Uh, and I looked it up and I could have sworn, um, I, I, because I couldn't figure out if Dion was a man or a woman, so I looked it up. It turned out it was a man, and then yesterday I realized it was a woman. Weird. Uh, it felt like I was in the middle of a Mendel effect. CERN, what are you doing? Okay, chapter four, the unwritten Kabbalah. All right, this is getting fun now. The point of view from which I approach the Holy Kabbalah in these pages differs, so far as I know, from that of all other writers on the subject, for to me it is a living system of spiritual development, not a historical curiosity that tracks with everything that Dion has said prior, starting with chapter 1. Few people, even among those interested in occultism, realize that there is an active esoteric tradition in our midst, handed down in private manuscripts and by mouth to ear. Mouth to ear. I love when people, writers in particular, um, really get down to the floorboards mouth to ear. That's what's happening right now, despite the layers of technology in between. That's a, that's a worthy note. Still fewer know that it is the Holy Kabbalah, the mystic system of Israel, which forms its basis. I would imagine that uh, Europeans of uh, 1935 would have been quite... what? unknown to these things. I mean, can you imagine like puritanical Britain engrossed in Jewish mysticism? I just don't see it in 1935. So that's like, well, I'll tell you where it was uh, uh, really prominent, I suppose, uh, Germany. Um, Hitler was a big fan of occultism or so they say. Um, I suppose it's a little incongruous that he'd be into Jewish mysticism, but like how do you get away from the Jewish part of mysticism? I suppose there's Celtic and other schools, I suppose. But, as Dion has argued in chapter one, they all sort of stem from the same root, which is Jewish. Huh, so I wonder how Hitler reconciled that in his own mind. I would assume he knew. In fact, he probably knew very well, hence the latent disregard for the lives of uh, Jewish people. All right. Still few know that the Holy Kabbalah, okay, so of Israel, which forms its basis, yes, okay. But where may we look more aptly for our occult inspiration than to the tradition which gave us the Christ? Dion doesn't mean Christianity or Catholicism. Dion means Jewishism. The interpretation of the Kabbalah is not to be found, however, among the rabbis of the outer Israel, who are Hebrews after the flesh, but among those who are the chosen people after the spirit, in other words, the initiates. This is very interesting. So, I don't know if Dion Fortune is of a Jewish descent or not, but it is my understanding that... Uh, um, you are either a Jew or not a Jew by way of your mother. I think some allow for conversions. Um, some that do allow conversions go back uh, or demand that 
conversions are made down the line, as it were, uh, down the matriarchal line. So if you want to convert, your mom has to convert as well. Others still, going back to the first point, uh, wouldn't consider it at all uh, more orthodox. Um, Jews. I was trying to think of a fancier word. Fancier word not needed. Here we go. Um, neither is the Kabbalah. Uh, oh, so what Dion is saying here is that uh, uh, <laughs> you can become a Jewish mystic by way of the initiation, which is quite something when you think about it. Anyway. Neither is the Kabbalah, as I have learned it, a purely Hebraic system. Okay, that's interesting. For it has been supplemented during medieval times by much alchemical lore and by the intimate association with it of that most marvelous system of symbolism, the tarot. That is interesting. It's interesting because, for multiple reasons, uh, uh, I have a lot of felt experience with um, uh, gypsies and gypsy culture. Um, in high school, we had uh, a gypsy camp set up, I guess around springtime, maybe it was even twice a year. So every time uh, at lunch, I'm walking around high school, there would be a camp of gypsies one part or two parts of the year. It may have been two parts of the year, like coming and going kind of thing. And they would be there for a couple of few weeks, maybe even as uh, uh, f as few days. Um, and it was interesting. It was a large field, like a football-sized field. And One day they would just show up with their tents, very colorful, and like they would erect a settlement overnight. And of course, uh, you know, being a kid in high school, you look uh, upon it with curiosity. Um, there was a fella who was uh, uh, settled, which was unusual for gypsies. They're on the move in Europe, always. Um, what I didn't know until recently is that they are, they are of Indian origin, which I suppose looks-wise makes sense, but I had no idea. I never made that connection until very recently, like maybe a year ago. Um, yeah, so, so they were... It was interesting. You know, the, the vibe was interesting, hard to capture in words, but I'll try. Um, they were there, but they were not, they were next to us, but they were not with us. And we were not with them. Um, kept to themselves, didn't like strangers. Although, um, nothing ever happened that I know of. Um, I think there's been, of course, rumors and accusations um the the few times when people would test the boundaries nothing happened um the whole of europe is is really interestingly permeated by the gypsy culture Tarot being an example, I grew up in a family of fortune tellers, um, matriarchically speaking. My mom, my grandma, and my father's side, both were, uh, both have made some bones fortune telling. Um, not entirely professionally, I wouldn't call it that. Uh, friends and neighbors kind of thing. And then, of course, Voynich Manuscript. Uh, which recently was um, theorized, hypothesized, if you will, that um, 
it is in fact of a gypsy origin um, and 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 that made perfect sense to me um, the the vibe of the Voynich manuscript is very much reminds me reminiscent of the vibe I would get get from that camp in high school um, the, the 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 sensibility the feel the look the 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 colors, all of that. Um, so the unfortunate is saying that you can be initiated into what is de facto Jewish mysticism um, through her, uh, certainly, right? way back when. Um, this uh, entire book strikes me as a kind of a lead gen uh, type of thing. Hey, come to my school. And rightfully so, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I like that it's taking Kabbalah and tarot and sort of putting it all in a mixer, in a blender. Will it blend? It might. All right. In my presentation of the subject, therefore, I do not appeal so much to tradition in support of my views as to modern practice among those who make use of the Kabbalah as their method of occult technique. It may be alleged against me that the ancient rabbis knew nothing of some of the concepts here set forth. I like old timey speak, here set forth. To this I reply that it is hardly to be expected that they should, as these things were not known in their day, but are the work of their successors of the spiritual Israel. The only objection I have to this book thus far is it's a lot of teasing and a lot of uh, uh, proving that she is the right source to drink from. This is really interesting when you think about it. Um, you know, writing a book is hard. Writing a book a uh, hundred years ago, when there were so very few resources about it, may have been even more difficult, or easier, who knows. Um, so, it, it's hard to critique someone who has published a book that's being read a hundred years later, and listened to by you right now. So, but I'll do it anyways. Um, <clears throat> I got the book. I'm sold, man. Give me the baby. That's how I feel about this. But, anyways. It may be alleged against me that ancient rabbis... Okay, I already read that part. Uh, I do like the, the frame of it may be alleged against me. Um, it, uh, it's, a, it's a good question to ponder. What may be alleged against me? For my part, although I would not willingly mislead anyone concerning the teachings of those of ancient days, and upon matters of historical accuracy stand subject to correction from any who are better informed than I am in these matters, and their name is Legion, I care not one jot for the authority of tradition if it hampers the free development of a system of such practical value as the Holy Kabbalah. And I use the work of my predecessors as a quarry whence I fetch the stone to build my city. <clears throat> Once again, uh, the unfortunate strikes a touchdown goal with her poetic prose. Uh, and also, uh, and, it, and it all sort of started with the attitude I care not one jot. I think it's jot. Let's uh, let's look up jot. That's not a word I see often. Jot, jot. Let's let's jot down. That's where that comes from, right? Write something quickly. Yeah. Jot them down. Okay. So so yeah. I I'm of course familiar with jotting things down. Um, but it's interesting how uh, the author used it here. I care not one jot. That's a really interesting way of phrasing that. One of the reasons um, 
I'm so enamored with these dusty old books. And then the poetry of it all, my God. Uh, the work of my predecessors as a quarry, a place where you fetch the stone from, no, undoubtedly, a place to play large deep pit from which stone or other materials are or have been extracted from therein. And then whence <laughs> I fetch the stone to build my st city. Um, fetch is another word. I, I was just talking to uh, Jillian about this yesterday. Yesterday, day before, I want to take the uh, fetch back. Uh, fetch is a great word. Uh, it was cold, so I went to the. Uh, the car was parked a little ways away. It was early in the morning, um, so like a good so, I um, went and fetched the car um, for her. So that it's closer to the door and that it's warmed up when she gets into it. Um, and I said, would you like me to fetch you your car? Of course she said yes. But it got us talking about the um, word fetch. It's a good word. And it has negative connotations because it's used uh, for dogs, go fetch, um, and to be used uh, on humans, fetch me that, might be appropriate for a child, but an adult would, might frown on it. But it's such a good word, you know, and it shouldn't have negative connotations. Um, to me, it has service connotations. And to be in service is a good thing. So, I'm, I'm befuddled um, how it fell out of favor. But, no need to dwell. And neither am I limited to this quarry by any ordinance that I know of. But fetch also cedar from Lebanon and gold from Ophir if it suits my purpose. Um... Once again, poetic prose, very lovely. Um, and what the unfortunate is saying is that uh, uh, she will take whatever she needs from wherever she can get it from. This is Pickle Rick all over again. Um, it's, it's the only way. There is no other way. Uh, you will make do with things that are at your disposal regardless of how few of those things you have and it doesn't matter how many things you have you'll always feel like you have too few unless you learn how to make do with things you have in which case you'll have more than you need well, that's something that is worth keeping in mind let it be clearly understood, therefore, that I do not say this is the teaching of the ancient rabbis. Rather do I say this is the practice of the modern Kabbalist, as for us a much more vital matter, for it is a practical system of spiritual unfoldment. It is the Yoga of the West. The Yoga of the West must have been a, like a kind of a um, catch-all marketing term, uh, you know, Far East, uh, Indian mysticism in the Western context must have had a lot deeper meaning 100, meaning, meaning 100 years ago. Having thus guarded myself as far as possible against blame for not having done what I never undertook to do, let me now define my own position in the matter of scholarship and general qualifications for the task in hand. I'm going to go ahead and assume, uh, and I'm being facetious here, that Dion Fortune rejects all authority that doesn't come from within. Let's see if that turns out to be the case. So far as actual scholarship goes, I'm in the same class as William Shakespeare, having little Latin and less Greek, and a Hebrew only that peculiar portion which is cultivated by occultists. 
the ability to transliterate unpointed Hebrew script for the purposes of geometric calculations. Okay, of any knowledge of Hebrew as a language, I am guiltless. <laughs> it's a great way of saying that. <laughs> I don't know anything. Of any knowledge of Hebrew as a language, I am guiltless. <laughs> Whether such frank acknowledgement of my deficiencies will serve to disarm criticism, I do not know. It did. It does. It's fine. I, it wasn't even necessary, Dion. Um, for an occultist, she should have known that this is her universe and we just live in it. Uh, so, I don't like seeing... Uh, people uh, communicating from that frame, which is unfortunate I mean, it's, it, uh, for me because most people communicate from that frame, myself included. Um, but I don't like seeing it. Um, it, it. It's always a reminder to me that um, we forget that we are one consciousness. And if you remember my attitude to, about that from chapter 3, uh, it's not a matter of whether or not it's true in, in, in Michael Shermer, Deepak Chopra way. Um, it's always disappointing to see a debate like that. And, and you know, those two are friends or have learned to be friendly. Uh, and whatnot, uh, but it's, it's, you know, you get Deepak Chopra, who English is his second language, he's trying to communicate something for which language doesn't exist. He's coming from behind already, man. Um, uh, beating the pants off him with your science, Michael Shermer, is not an accomplishment. Um, also... I was watching Michael Shermer being interviewed uh, by Jordan Peterson. It's a good interview, highly recommend it, in which he talked about visiting Deepak Chopra's uh, retreat and engaging in meditation and uh, chanting and sound therapy and silence therapy, etc., etc. And uh, he's like, well, you know, I see how this might be something to do. Uh, I see how meditation might help, etc., etc. Um, but his frame was entirely as if this outward-facing, constant interaction with the three-dimensional reality is the proper default mode. And I'm not convinced. Um, I'm convinced uh, uh, now that I've had 40 years behind my back um, I'm convinced that, in fact, the opposite is true. Um, <laughs> at least that's how I've been able to find some sanity. Um, operate from within. Um, meditative state as a default mode. And then sometimes, and only when necessary, exiting out of that mode into this outward facing um, culture, civilization of ours. So check your fundamental premises, Michael Shermer. You may find them to be flawed. Sorry, I don't mean to criticize. Uh, he's, an, he's a nice fellow. I like him very much. I, um, I, I'm, I've read several of his books. That, that one just vexed me because it's, well, it's not only materialistic position that he took on, which, again, it's like it's so easy to beat people over the head with science. Uh, you, you define the boundaries, you set the rules, and then you get thousands of people to follow the process and confirm the findings. Uh, and then you interpret that as you wish. Um, or as commonly interpreted, or commonly agreed upon. Um, 
right? It's like easy to beat people over the head with uh, with facts. Um, try doing it with finesse and and uh, kindness and love. Yeah, try beating people over the head with love. No, not so easy. <laughs> Okay, no doubt it will be alleged against me and not without justification that one so ill-equipped should not have undertaken the task at all. I like the, uh, uh, the concatenation, I'm using a too fancy a word, ill-equipped, um, that word. Uh, it, it reminds me of dogma, uh, Kevin Smith, ill-equipped. Um, when the archangel yeah the highest order of angels metatron the voice of god that's it um he tells to the last zion she was she was fearful that he may rape her and he goes Girl in PJs, settle down. Besides, I'm ill-equipped. And then he shows her that there's nothing where the penis should be. Uh, that was a great movie. Uh, we should watch it. Okay. To this I reply that if one saw a man lying injured, should the admitted absence of a medical qualification debar one from going to his assistance and giving him what help one could? pending the arrival of qualified attention. I suppose triage and first aid should be provided. Uh, I suppose you're right. Um, should be tempered with the uh, possibility that you might do more harm than good. My work upon the Kabbalah is of the nature of first aid. That's interesting. I find an invaluable system lying neglected and, and ill-qualified for the task as I may be. I'm striving to draw attention to its possibilities and restore it um, to its proper place as the key to Western occultism. And it is my chief hope in so doing that it may attract the attention of scholars and that they will continue the task of translation and investigation of the Kabbalistic manuscripts. Which, as, which are as yet a vein of which only the outcroppings have been worked. So there's a lot there. Um, it's, um, I've seen this before. I've seen this kind of call to adventure. And I like it. Um, what the unfortunate is doing here is saying, hey, there's a lot more here. Maybe you should check it out. There's a lifetime of knowledge and learning um, behind these words. Come get it. Um, what's his name? Hmm. He's an alien conspiracy fella. Eric von Deineken brilliantly creative mind um, uh, ancient a lot of ancient aliens stuff is based on Eric von Deineken um, and uh, one of the things he said in one of his videos Terry was a terrible sound um, very hollow because the microphone was across the room but um, he mentioned that there's uh, over 300,000 cuneiform tablets that remain unanalyzed that are found in Sumerian, um, you know, uh, sites. Are, um, what would you call them? Um, archaeological sites. These are archaeological findings. And, you know, I've, I've only skimmed the surface of Sumerian uh, language, but my God, it's so brilliant. Um, do yourself a favor and 
uh, find out how Sumerians wrote down numbers. It's um, it's incredible. Um, anyways, Eric Van Dyneken was saying that uh, hey, if you're looking for a purpose in life, three hundred thousand cuneiform tablets are awaiting your examination. Um, and don't worry about not knowing Sumerian. No one does. So, uh, but there's enough people who do um, that um, even a short examination of Sumerian will quickly elevate you to expert status. Um, yeah. And uh, who knows what you can do with that and what you can find. I I'm fascinated by the fact that... Uh, uh, well, what must have, what must have their brain looked like um, to them, felt like to them, uh, given the fact that they didn't have mass culture, they didn't have this common culture that we have at scale. Uh, it was a lot more intimate, a lot more closer, a lot smaller. A um, lot less changes, a lot less novelty. A lot more focus, right? And so what kind of mind did that create? Uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to imagine that with our brains that are completely rattled by the internet and by the mass culture. Rattled, riddled, um, raped might be an appropriate word as well. Um, our, our minds are taken over by the mass culture. Culture is not your friend, as Terence McKenna says. And I do everything that Terence McKenna says. Forgive me, that was my British dry humor coming across. Um, I grew up on Monty Python. One qualification for my task I can plead in justification, however. One qualification for my task I can plead in justification, however. Dion uses this however work in the middle of a sentence sometimes. I had a, a hard time with it in the first chapter. Um, writers have a cadence. And sometimes it takes a while to get used to it. And, um, and reading this out loud for the first time, because I, I don't read it in advance, that would spoil the fun for me. <clears throat> Um, but yeah, it takes some time to get accustomed to uh, the cadence and the, the way the author writes. For the last 10 years, I have lived and moved and had my being in the practical Kabbalah. Love the way that's phrased. Uh, had my being in the practical Kabbalah. I have used its methods both subjectively and objectively till they have become a part of myself and I know from experience what they yield in psychic and spiritual results and their incalculable value as a method of using the mind. You know, I went into this text already convinced of this notion and uh, frankly, I'm getting a little tired of Dion Fortune teasing me. Um, we're four chapters in. Get to the good stuff is what I'm saying. It is not required of those who would use the Kabbalah as their yoga that they should acquire any extensive knowledge of the Hebrew language. Okay. I wouldn't mind. I mean, let's, let's get to it, man. All they need is to be able to read and write the Hebrew characters. Okay. The modern Kabbalah has been pretty thoroughly naturalized in the English language, but it retains and must ever retain all its words of power in Hebrew, which is the sacred language of the West, just as Sanskrit is the sacred language of the East. 
That is a very interesting position. So, uh, English language retains all words of power um, which is the secret language of the West. I apologize for that notification. <sighs> I'm playing some classical music in the background, so I'm connected to the internet. I'm not typically uh, connected to the internet. Hence, no notifications. I must have been jarring to you. Once again, apologies. But this idea of... Uh, words of power in Hebrew maintaining their presence in the English language the way Sanskrit is the sacred language of the East huh very interesting There are those who have objected to the free employment of Sanskrit terms in occult literature. And no doubt they will object even more strongly to the employment of Hebrew characters, but their use is unavoidable, for every letter in Hebrew is also a number. And the numbers to which words add up are not only an important clue to their significance, but can also be used to express the relationship, relationships existing between different ideas and potencies. To me, this sounds a lot like a, a, a keyword that I've been encountering a lot. Uh, um, and I've labeled it as unbound. Um, as opposed to bound, uh, as in bound up, as in um, overtly categorized, as in what... Western mind and scientific mind and an engineering mind does uh, define clear boundaries between things. And then in order for you to... I, I guess the question is, are we able to comprehend the universe in its entirety? No. So we have to narrow it down to something more manageable. But as we grow older, um, those uh, bounded categories that help us when we are in the third grade, and we call it calculus, for example, um, it's useful to, uh, to a beginner. It's useful to an intermediate thinker. Um, but it's not so useful when you've been looking at that stuff your whole life and you're trying to find what's true across all levels of analysis. At that moment, you have to take what's bound and break the bounds, boundaries, bonds, and make it unbound. And I think that's what uh, Dion is talking about here. Uh, why not pull from Sanskrit? Why not um, pull from Hebrew? Why not pull from anywhere? Who cares? Um, according to McGregor Mathers, in the admirable essay which forms the introduction to this book, the Kabbalah is usually classed under four heads. Okay. The practical Kabbalah, which deals with talismanic and ceremonial magic. Talisman might be a word that uh, some are not familiar with. It means like a lucky charm, a rabbit's foot. An object, typically an inscribed ring or stone, that is thought to have magic powers and to bring good luck. Um, 
it's very uh, uh, these kind this kind of um, definition is dangerous uh, because it's incompatible with the thought patterns that a Western mind engages in. The moment you say that is thought of to have magic powers and to bring good luck. A scientific mind will uh, reject it out of hand as gobbledygook, uh, hogwash, um, something that's uh, closer to superstition than reality. And um, if, if that's what you end up thinking, then you'll never find what is true about it. And what if there is some truth to it? Um, a better question is, in which ways does it bring magic powers? And the ways in which it brings magic powers in, uh, in let's call it closer to scientific uh, terms, is like this. Placebo effect works over 60% of the time. That's scientific. So if talisman's only effect is uh, the effect of the um, placebo, <laughs> that's good enough. And it's true enough um, in terms of having magic powers. Uh, there, no more magic is needed than that. And that amount of magic is scientifically verifiable. Uh, so this is the way in which um, I prefer to unbound these categories. And then in, I forget, chapter 2 or 3, um, we've talked a bit about uh, uh, the importance of ceremony. It's, um, well, I mean, it's fun, first of all, um, particularly if you're the one um, defining this, the, the ceremony. All right, the dogmatic Kabbalah, which consists of the Kabbalistic literature, okay? The literal Kabbalah, which deals with the use of letters and numbers, okay? And then unwritten Kabbalah, ooh, which consists of correct knowledge of the manner in which the symbol systems are arranged on the tree of life and concerning which McGregor Mather says, I may say no more on this point, not even whether I myself have or have not received it. Way to be coy, Mathers. But as this portentous, portentous, let's look at portentous, 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 of or like a portent, portent, the envelope and its portentous contents, done in a pompously or overly solemn manner so as to impress ah, the author's portentous moralizing. Ominous, warning, premonitory, threatening, menacing, ill-omened, foreboding, inauspicious, unfavorable, portentous dialogue, pompous, bombastic. Is this pretentious? Have I been saying that word the wrong way the entire time? Is pretentious different? Wow. All right. Well, pretentious. I'm a, uh, but as this pretentious hint is elaborated by the late Miss, Mrs. McGregor Mathers, right, MRS, Mrs., in her, okay, introduction to the new edition of his book, in the following plain spoken words. I'm a little confused as to are they two McGregor Matherses, and one is a dude, the other one's his wife? Or is this all about some lady magicians? Hmm. Huh. Okay. Let's see what uh, uh, Mrs. Mathers said. Simultaneously with the publication of the Kabbalah in 1887, he received, uh, 
He received instructions from his occult teachers to prepare what was eventually to become his esoteric school. Okay. It may be justifiable to say that if he did receive the unwritten Kabbalah, it has for some years ceased to be unwritten. For after a quarrel with McGregor Mathers, Aleister Crowley, the well-known author and scholar, published The Lot. His books are now rare and hard to come by, and being much valued by the more scholarly uh, uh, of esotericists, their price has gone up out of sight, and they seldom come into the second-hand book market. That's interesting, because... <sighs> I'm sure Alistair Crowley is uh, pretty easy to come by these days. Okay. The breaking of an initiation oath is a serious matter and a thing that I, for my part, do not care to do. But I admit of no authority that uh, debars me from collecting and collating all available material that has been published upon any subject and interpreting it according to the best of my understanding. <laughs> well, that's walking the line, isn't it? Uh, that's like just the tip. Um, it's, in effect, what I'm doing right now. So... Um, I, uh, I admit no authority... Uh, one way or the other, but certainly not the one that debars me from collecting and uh, collating all available material that has been published upon any subject, well, exactly what I'm doing right now, and interpreting it according to the best of my understanding. Once again, exactly what I'm doing in this video. Um, so, the unfortunate, I can relate. <clears throat> In these pages, it is the system given by Crowley of which I shall avail myself to supplement the points upon which McGregor Mathers, Wynne Westcott, and I.E. A.E. White, the principal modern authorities upon the Kabbalah, are silent. Interesting. So these were the lanterns of the uh, or first part of 1900s England. Uh, that uh, that had the uh, knowledge as to whether I myself have received any knowledge of the unwritten Kabbalah this is all so irrelevant hundred years later it would be ill beseem me oh, I love this this is worth it beseem befit as ill beseem me as McGregor Mathers to be explicit upon this point and having followed his classic example of burying my head in the sand and waving my tail, I will return to the consideration of the matter at hand. Uh, there seems to be a bit of resentment of some sort here. Um, let that be a lesson to all of us. Someone may be reading our stuff a uh, hundred years later. How much of what we do say, write, is relevant 100 years later? Of course, that's a pretty arbitrary number. We could say 100 days or 1,000 years. Worth meditating on. The essence of the unwritten Kabbalah lies in the knowledge of the order in which certain sets of symbols are arranged upon the tree of life. This tree... Ashim, O T Z, C H I I M, Ashim, Ashim, interesting. So I suppose a, a tree of life is also known as Ashim. Let's verify that. Oh yeah, um, the tree of life. Or Etz Hachaim. Okay. Etz Hachaim in Hebrew is a classic descriptive term of the central mystical symbol used in the Kabbalah of esoteric Judaism, also known as the Ten Sephirot and the 22 Paths. 
Um, the tree of the uh, human uh, system design must be based on a tree of life because uh, it's very similar in this regard. It's a diagrammatic representation arranged in three columns or pillars may derive from older sources arranged in uh, older sources and is not known to the earlier Jewish tradition. Yeah, you go far enough, you lose tra uh, track of the source. The chain of evidence breaks apart. The tree, visually or conceptually, represents, uh, represents as a series of divine emanations God's creation itself ex nihilo, ex nihilo, n-i-h-i-l-o, ex nihilo, I don't know. The nature of revealed uh, divinity, the human soul, and the spiritual path of ascent by man. In this way, Kabbalistics developed a symbol into a full model of reality using the tree to depict a map of creation. Well, I'm just stoked to learn more about it, man. All right, so... Uh, Etz Hachim consists of the ten holy sephiroth arranged in a, partic in a particular pattern and connected by lines which are called the 32 paths of the sapphire yatsara or divine emanations. We just read that in the dictionary. So the sapphire yatsara by Wynn Westcott. Oh, C, the sapphire yatsara by Wynn Westcott. Don't tell me what to do, Dion. Um, here there exists one of the blinds or traps for the uninitiated in which the ancient rabbis delighted. This sounds a lot like uh, meditative practices that um, gurus of India uh, bestow upon the adults of Western culture. We find, if we count them, that there are 22, not 32 paths upon the tree. We find there are 22, not 30. Who said there were 32? Maybe uh, this uh, Westcott fella. Uh, but for their purposes, the rabbis treated the ten sephiroths themselves as paths, thus misleading the uninitiated. Bastards. Thus, the first ten paths of the Sephar Yetzirah are assigned to the ten Sephiroth, and the following twenty-two are the actual paths themselves. Okay? It will then be seen how the twenty-two letters of the Hebrew alphabet can be associated with the paths without discrepancy or overlapping. With them also are associated the twenty-two tarot trumps, the Adis, uh, or abodes of Thoth. Abodes is a place of residence, right? A place of residence. And then Thoth is an Egyptian god of something, rather. A moon god. Oh, the god of wisdom, justice, Thoth. Thoth. Well, it's funny that his name is Thoth. Concerning the tarot cards, there or tarot, I like tarot. I like the uh, uh, non-silent T at the end. Anyways, uh, concerning the tarot cards, there are three modern authorities of note: uh, Doctor Encaus or Pappus, the French writer; Mister A. E. Waite or White. I don't know. Uh, I, but I think we saw that fella earlier. And the MSS of McGregor Mathers. Okay. Order of the Golden Dawn, which Crowley published upon his own authority. Okay, that's the continuation of that Mathers business. All three are different concerning the system uh, Mr. White gives. He himself says there is another method known to initiates. There is reason to suppose that this is the method used by Mathers. Okay. By reading all of them, you may get a fuller picture, it seems. Pappas disagrees with both these writers in his method, but as his system does 
violence to many of the correspondences when placed upon the tree, the final test of all systems, and as the Mathers-Crowley system fits admirably, I think we may justly conclude that the letter is the correct traditional order, and I propose to adhere to it in these pages. Well, I'm a big fan of the position that Pappas uh, is taking. Um, fitting in be damned is one way to look at it. Uh, but another way to look at it could be that he was out of his depth and he just made some crap up. So. Sounds like a more likely scenario uh, in this instance, but who knows. Uh, the Kabbalists further placed upon the paths of the tree the signs of the zodiac, the planets, and the elements. Hmm. Now there are 12 signs, 7 planets, and 4 elements, making 23 symbols in all. How are these to be fitted on the 22 paths? Herein is another blind, but the solution is simple. Upon the physical plane, we are ourselves in the element of earth. Therefore, that symbol does not appear upon the paths which lead into the unseen. Right. To perhaps take this into um, a scientific realm, uh, Einstein uh, was a famous scientist in general. Um, when they talk about um, cosmic movement, uh, talk about uh, the point of reference. So as the point of reference changes, so does the nature of movement um, and so here we are ourselves the element of earth as in the point of reference um, so that is to say that in uh, Kabbalah what is known as science in science as point of reference in Kabbalah is just known as well the same thing Really, it's just, they say it in a different way. Anyways, remove this and we are left with 22 symbols which fit accurately and correctly placed are found to correspond perfectly with the tarot trumps, each elucidating the other in the most remarkable fashion, giving the keys to esoteric astrology and tarot divination. In retrospect, I really wish uh, the writer got to it uh, and omitted these four chapters. They seem truly unnecessary, but a lot of fun to read and to sort of see what insecurities the author carried with himself. Um, and what wonderful language... Uh, was produced, perhaps due to some of that insecurity. That's truly fascinating. The essence of each path is to be found in the fact that it connects two of the Sephiroth, and we can only understand its significance by taking into account the nature of the linked spheres upon the tree. But a Sephiroth cannot be understood upon a single plane. It has a fourfold nature, doesn't everything. The Kabbalists express this by saying that there are four worlds. Ooh, let's check that out. Atzaluth, the archetypical world, or world of emanations, the divine world. In slightly more scientific terms, uh, this is the world that's been elucidated by Carl Jung to the rest of us. Speaking of which, I've been thinking of... Um, Doing Alchemy by Carl Jung next. Um, I probably will do that. Bria, the world of creation, also called Corsia, the world of thrones. So that seems like a kingly realm. It's perhaps the last human realm. The most ascended human realm. 
Yetzirah, the world of formation and of angels. Hmm, wonder where that fits in a broader scheme of things. Other than the obvious, of course, the sort of heaven, heavenly bodies, which is what angels are. Uh, see it, the world of action, the world of matter. Hmm. Right. As, as an engineer, I am supremely interested in the world of action, the world of matter. And I am supremely interested in how these three other worlds instruct us in the, in the language of action. It's the whole purpose of these learnings, really. Okay, so the Kabbalists express this uh, as four worlds. Atzaluth, Bria, Yetzirah, and Asiya. Huh. Okay. The ten holy sephiroth are held to have each its own point of contact with each of the four worlds of the Kabbalists. In the Atzaluthic world, they manifest through the ten holy names of God. In other words, the great unmanifest shadowed forth through the three negative veils of existence which hang behind the crown declares itself in manifestation as ten different aspects which are represented by the different names used to denote deity in the Hebrew scriptures. Wow! It's a lot to unpack. Uh, ten holy names of God, Atzaluthic world, uh, three negative veils of existence behind the crowned, crown, crown, It's a lot to unpack. I have no idea what to make of it. These are various rendered in the authorized version, and a knowledge of their true significance and the spheres to which they belong enables us to read many of the riddles of the Old Testament. All right. In the Briatic world, the divine emanations are held to manifest through the ten mighty archangels, whose names play such an important part in ceremonial magic. It is the worn and effaced remnants of these worlds of power that are the barbarous names of evocation of medieval magic, not one letter of which may be changed. Hmm. So, Briatic world is the world of thrones. But it's also the world of divine emanations manifest through ten mighty archangels who I assume belong to Yatsara. So it's funny how they overlap and spill into one another. <clears throat> and, and King Lee excuse me while I drink some water. It's interesting that uh, kingly world also represents the kind of a uh, solidified patriarchy <sighs> tradition, <clears throat> the kind of things that cannot be changed. Um, and that's that's interesting. Why this why this is so may readily be seen when we remember that the Hebrew a letter is also a number. And the numbers of a name have an important significance. Perhaps this will readily be seen later. But right now, Dion, I fail to see it. In the Yetzirotic world of divine emanations manifest not through a single being, but through different types of beings, which are called the angelic hosts or choirs. The Asiatic world is not, strictly speaking, the world of matter when viewed from the Sephirotic standpoint, but rather the lower astral and etheric planes which together form the background of matter. <clears throat> okay, so this is interesting. Um, I think the way we might say this if we were, say, Nikola Tesla 
is that, um, um, you know, scientifically speaking, by the way, uh, I'm just a huge fan of Nikola Tesla. And um, I, I just think he's like the, the he, he like figured everything out and we're still catching up. Um, and I would also add that science is in a serious dire straits. It's in a serious in a dark alley, and and it's a it's a dead end street. Um, future can't go where the language hasn't been, and the language of science has been um, limited, has been confined, too confined. Um, and we only need to think that words, we only need to understand that words are metaphors. Even though they may have specific meaning, they conjure up different thoughts in different people's head, even if it's the same word. So, so the mathematical outcomes of scientific experiments are mere interpretations. And to prove that, you only have to interpret the same results in the same way in two different languages to understand that they are interpretations. Um, and so, a language will have its own peculiarities and limitations. They're not necessarily inherent in the language, although they are, but they're also inherent in A, the speaker, and B, the listener. And you add a temporal component to that whole thing, say a hundred year difference, um, and all of a sudden, you know, a hundred years ago, people talked about ether, um, but 50 years ago, we understood ether to be uh, a nothing or a non issue. It doesn't exist, scientifically speaking. To now, um, <laughs> Uh, well, ether explains a lot of peculiarities, um, and we don't have a better word for it. Uh, and um, and and perhaps more broadly speaking, ether seems to have been supplanted by uh, the word gravity. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a huge uh, difference um, between the two. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a deep understanding of either. So. So what are we to make of that? Um, getting back to Nikola Tesla, uh, the way he viewed the world was um, it was a magnetoelectric vibration. Um, and this, uh, this electromagnetic vibration sounds a lot like this background of matter that Dion Fortune is talking about. At least it seems that way to me. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about this, uh, well, read some Nikola Tesla. Uh, but also, uh, uh, there's a, a, a kind of a community of scientific outcasts and researchers and practitioners of other disciplines, uh, one being alchemy, for example. Um, see... Aubrey Forrest, the modern-day alchemist, um, for a perfect example of that. Um, electric universe. Uh, there's a growing body of evidence that uh, the way to interpret our universe through language is to reach for the, the kinds of words and the kinds of metaphors uh, that uh, the scientific community that's been built around this idea of electric universe has been using. Um, I'm not deeply versed in it myself, but the skimming of the surface that I've done thus far indicates to me that it might contain um, the beginnings of the right language, the right words for us to speak about science. Uh, say, 10 or 100 years from now. Yeah. Upon the physical plane, the divine emanations manifest through what may not inaptly be called the 10 mundane chakras. 
I assume they mean mundane in a traditional sense, although lacking interest or excitement. Yeah, okay. Um, I think uh, the fact that it's capitalized harkens back to chapter one, where uh, Dion did a bit of housekeeping and explained how uh, the book is going to be structured. Uh, and uh, he said that he will capitalize certain things uh, under circum circ circumstances, but I forgot exactly what it was. It doesn't matter. He means it, she means it in a mundane way. Okay. Upon the physical plane, the divine emanations manifest through what may not inaptly be called the ten mundane chakras, likening these centers. centers. Um, this is a European spelling of center. The middle point of the sphere. Uh, I like that spelling, like program. Uh, the British spelling is nice also. Likening these centers uh, of manifestation to the centers that exist in the human body. Uh, an exact analogy. Right. Right. Don't think of chakras as something abstract. It's something quite real. Um, all you have to do is think about your solar plexus and how it's tight most of the time. Think about your throat your sphincter, um, your shoulders. Um, these things uh, carry within them certain tightness. <sighs> Breathing properly, relaxing these areas uh, can unlock a huge dormant reserves of energy. Um, this is just logic, man. <laughs> Uh, no science needed. Uh, we can all we all have felt experience of this. So speaking of chakras, take that stuff seriously. I'm trying to do it myself. A friend of mine is telling me that I have orange squirrels in my belly because it's too tight, and he's probably right. You know, women think. Young ladies think that they're the only ones that are impacted by the images of uh, photoshopped celebrities on the covers of magazines. No, um, men are impacted by these images as well, just the same. Uh, we are made to feel insecure because we don't have a six-pack. So what do we do? We walk around with our bellies tight. So as to not look as Total fat slobs, that is. Uh, and so, I have a right-hand shoulder. I call it my wellness shoulder. Because uh, whenever I'm not treating myself right, I'm not exercising, I'm too stressed, I'm doing things I'm not supposed to be doing, my right hand shoulder tightens up and lets me know that I'm not taking care of myself. And that's my harbinger of uh, wellness. Um, because when I hear from the harbinger of wellness, my right hand shoulder, I know that I need to pay attention to what I'm doing and brings me back into the moment. The pain has a tendency to do that bring you into the moment and force you to deal with whatever it is you've been trying to blind yourself to. It will be seen from the foregoing that each sephira will therefore consist firstly of its mundane chakra, secondly of an angelic host of beings, devas or archons. Devas are, is an Indian term, archons is a Middle Eastern term. Let's look that up. Um, Archon, each of the nine chief magistr magistrates, excuse me, a bit of a hiccup. In ancient Athens, any ruler rocks archons or disc jockeys and concert promoters. I see. Um, archonship. 
from Greek ruler now to use in the present particle or archon to rule. That's interesting. Um, I am familiar with archons from uh, Sumerian texts, but you know, whatever. And Deva, a member of a class of divine being in Vedic period, which is Indian, right? Okay, so we can think of this as, uh, let's say, uh, uh, more appropriately to our culture. Uh, Devas are Indian origin, Archons are Greek origin. Although, you know, if you research Sumeria, you find out that uh, they've had everything. Everything we have, they had. The courts, the government, the irrigation system, the the culture, the, the everything. Um, there is not a component of a modern society, and our modern society is based on Greek society, um, that uh, Sumerians didn't have. And they had this before the Egyptians. And they, um, and they just sort of appeared out of nowhere having everything, having figured everything out. Um, this is an inconvenient thing to explain to children. Um, if you get too deeply into Sumeria, inevitably you ask yourself a question, well, wait a second. If they were a fully formed, articulated society, and they were, um, then where did it all come from? And of course, you know, everybody's got their favorite theory. Um, my favorite theory, I wish it was true, is aliens. Um, but, it uh, doesn't leave a lot of room for meditation. Um, and so, how could have such a culture evolved? Um, and there's no records of them, of their evolution. They just sort of, you know, showed up. Is that a function of time? passing undoubtedly that's part of it is it a function perhaps of the previous ice age um, destroying existing civilizations and then some survivors going into uh, uh, these populations or perhaps starting those populations um, and you know having that knowledge from the previous civilization uh, he, Here's one way to think about it. Um, uh, tomorrow, there could be an electromagnetic pulse that wipes out our entire uh, technological advancements uh, and our entire civilization for hundreds of years. What would then happen uh, to us? Well, we would undoubtedly devolve in some ways. We couldn't use technology. Um, we might be able to adapt to the electromagnetic interference uh, ourselves as organic matter, uh, and let's assume that we are. The technology is off the table, and so what do we do? We would return to archaic um, uh, ways of life. Um, but we would still have this knowledge. Um, and... Um, and, of course, we would try to pass on this knowledge. And what's the first thing we would do? We would probably start to write things down on tablets made of clay uh, that, um, that we know will be, could be preserved for thousands of years, for example. Um, and to a culture thousands of years from now, they would have no information about our digital technology at that point. Um, now, going back to magnetoelectric uh, uh, vibrational universe that we all live in, um, well, something like that seems quite likely when, when connected in such a fashion. Uh, and scientifically speaking, we know we've gone through multiple extinction, extinction events. So... Um, this seems like the most logical theory to me. Else, how do we explain Sumerians being a fully articulated society? I, it's, it's hard for me. 
Because it's not like it's a, uh, a subtle drop-off uh, as you go further back in time. No, it's like we found one spot with like hundreds of thousands of clay tablets and we dug it out. I mean, geez. Anyways. Um, so, so I say all of that to say that Archons, um, being of, let's say, Greek origin, is a typical kind of a Western articulation of the ancient origins. It all goes back to Egypt, and then if it's not that far back, it's like Greece and Athens and whatnot. Um, and Romans a, a little bit later on. Like, that's where the lineage ends. Uh, but, uh, but it doesn't, not in reality. Uh, very little uh, uh, was known by the Greeks that wasn't known by the Egyptians or the uh, Sumerians prior. So, anyways, principalities or powers, according to the terminology used. <clears throat> Let's read that again. Secondly, of an angelic host of beings, devas or archons, principalities or powers, according to the terminology used. All right, I don't, whatever. Thirdly, an archangelic consciousness or throne. And fourthly, a special aspect of the deity. Okay. God as he is in his entirety, being hidden behind the negative veils of existence, incomprehensible to unenlightened human consciousness. Right. Hidden behind the negative veils of existence, incomprehensible to unenlightened human consciousness. So this goes back to an esoteric, occultish idea. Um, and, and this idea has its roots in Egypt, and of course, whatever's uh, in Egypt is in Sumeria. Um, not that they are the same, um, but I mean that in things that were known to Egyptians were certainly known to Sumerians. Even though Sumerians came earlier. I feel like I'm really beating that dead horse. I apologize. For some reason, I'm stuck on it. Okay. <clears throat> Hidden behind the negative veils of existence. Um, so, it's a little confusing because this is placed in capitalization. Uh, these are capital letters. So, um... Now that I remember the housekeeping rules in chapter one and the author saying that some proper nouns or whatever it was will be capitalized because it's meant in a certain way, I'm starting to think that um, uh, this would be much more appropriately written in lowercase. I think the uppercase is confusing the issue, making me think that it's some kind of a place or a thing that... Um, that that one can go to, I guess. Which I suppose one can visit negative veils of existence. In fact, most of us live there most of the time. Which is why enlightened human consciousness is incomprehensible to unenlightened human consciousness. And that sounds right to me. Um... Negative veil of existence is where I've spent most of my life. I imagine that it's the place where I'm going to spend uh, uh, most of the rest of my life. And it's um, a kind of a struggle. Hmm, that's probably the wrong word. It's, uh, it's going to be struggle in the beginning because we figure it's a struggle. Um, but struggle is not the right word. Um, Resonance. Uh, you know, we step into this negative space. And we can step into the positive space as well. We just don't know how. And we don't even try. But it's funny. It's when we do try, uh, somehow the source provides us with the right answer. Um, and I think that's part of the... Uh, the trick of it all is to slow down, pause, ask the right question, 
listen for an answer. Uh, so Jim Carrey, a uh, uh, video on YouTube, uh, he was saying, dare to ask the universe the question. There's nothing new, of course. Many uh, gurus and soothsayers have uh, recommended uh, something like that uh, in one way or another. Um, and it's true. You ask a question, you ask questions you don't know, you get answers you don't want to hear. Uh, a friend of mine has a habit of saying that. He's being a little facetious, of course. But, um, yeah, the answers you hear will <laughs> likely be the answers you didn't expect, that's for sure. Okay, the Sephiroth may justly be considered macrocosmic, and the paths microcosmic. For the Sephiroth, connected as they sometimes are in... Uh, old diagrams by a flash of lightning, which is often depicted as hilted like a fiery sword, represent the successive divine emanations, which constitute creative evolution, whereas the path represents the successive stages of the unfolding of cosmic realization in human consciousness. In old pictures, a serpent is often de depicted as twined about the bows of a tree. I don't know this word at all. Bow. A main branch of a tree. Apple bow laden with blossom. Old English. Boo. Boo or shoulder. Hmm. Of Germanic origin related to Dutch boog. Bow, bag, shoulders, or ship's bow, bow, mm. German bug, ship's bow, horse's hawk, or shoulder, hmm. snow laden, laden pine bows, branch, limb, arm, offshoot, okay, bows of a tree, okay, about the bows of a tree, that's a lot of letters for a very short sound, bow, Bow. You just spell that B-O, you know. Um, this is how the language evolves. Um, I might spell bows of a tree of the tree as just B-O, um, and rely on the context, i.e., of the tree, to provide the U-G-H-S. Um, for context. Okay. This is the serpent Nechustan. Ha! Oh, that's a great word. I've never heard it before. Okay. There's a... Uh, <laughs> There's a Israeli diplomat, ya Yaakov Nehoshtat, former Israeli politician, diplomat who serves as a member of Nasset for Gahal between 1969 and 74, and an ambassador to the Netherlands between 82 and 85, 1982 and 1985. Huh. That's obviously not what's meant here, but okay. This is the serpent Neshustat, who held death his tail in his mouth. Oh yeah, yeah, Ouroboros, the symbol of wisdom and initiation. Right. The coils of this serpent, when correctly arranged upon the tree, cross each of the paths in succession and serve to indicate the order in which they should be numbered. Okay. With the help of this glyph, then, it is the simple matter to arrange all the tables of symbols in their correct position upon the tree, granted that the symbols are given in their correct order in the tables. So this is now about the arrangement of the tree of life, which is just as well, I suppose. 
In certain modern books which rank as authorities upon the subject, the correct order is not given, the writers apparently holding that this should not be revealed to the uninitiated. That's assuming that there is the correct order, which I am not convinced of, Dion Fortune. But as this order is given correctly in certain older books, and for the matter of that, in the Bible itself and the Kabbalistic literature, there seems to me no point in deliberately misleading students with the spurious information. Love the word spurious. Spurious is one of my favorite words, not being what it purports to be. Purports is another great word. False or fake, separating authentic and spurious claims. Right, like a spur spurious line of reasoning, apparently but not actually valid. So there's a lot of spurious argumentation in modern culture. Uh, be on the lookout for that. To refuse to divulge anything but justifiable, but how is it possibly to justify the handing on of misleading statements? Listen, Dion, we all think you're a saint, man. Just get to it. No one is going to be persecuted nowadays for their studies in unorthodox sciences. We'll see. Huh. So there can be but one purpose in withholding teaching that relates solely to the theory of the universe and the philosophy arising therefrom, and in no way to the methods of practical magic, and that purpose is to retain a monopoly of the knowledge which confers prestige, if not power. Right. Right. So Dion Fortune wants to be on the right side of history here. Good on you. For my part, I believe that this selfishness and exclusiveness is the bane of the occult movement rather than its safeguard. Well, selfishness and exclusiveness is a bane of many. So I can see it being such thing in the occult as well. <clears throat> we should talk about the word occult. <clears throat> and uh, the, the proper understanding of the word occult has been illuminated to me by Aubrey Forrest, the modern-day alchemist on YouTube. Um, um, occult. And let's, in fact, go to the... <clears throat> meaning of a cult. Okay, so a cult is a noun, supernatural, mystical, or magical beliefs, practices, or phenomena, a secret society to study alchemy and the occult. Um, as an adjective involving relating to supernatural, in medicine, accompany, accompanied by readily discernible signs or symptoms. Okay. Um, verb, cut off from view by interposing something, a wooden screen designed to occult the competitors. Right, or like um, a one-way mirror uh, in uh, police stations, in interrogations room. Let's see, late 15th century, uh, occultare, secret, uh, frequentative of ocular, conceal, based on calere, or salere, to hide, the adjective and noun from a cult covered over. Uh, <clears throat> so, so those are sort of the standard dictionary de depictions of the word occult, and I use the word depiction on purpose. Um, because, you know, it reveals a portion of the meaning. Um, uh, every dictionary entry reveals a portion of the meaning. The full meaning is abstracted and uh, um, unbound only once it enters a person's mind. And the way um, Aubrey Forrest has made me understand the occult, the word occult, is... Um, is 
there is known to me, to each and every one of us. There are things that I know, and then there's things that I don't know. Of course, things that I don't know are many. Um, and I don't mean that in terms of um, the human knowledge database. Um, our human knowledge database is vast indeed. There are a lot of things each of us could know. Um, and we perhaps know a tiny microscopic fraction of the entirety of the human knowledge. But that's not all that is occulted. That is not all that is unknown. Um, there's the, the entirety of the human knowledge is a tiny little fraction of what could be known about the universe and what is what could be known about the universe. Let's go with that. Um, so the, these are orders of separation, and, and we as individuals are capable of knowing very, very, very little. Um, we found technology we use technology to reveal what's beyond us, to learn what's beyond us. But there's also so much that we can't know. Um, and a cult, well, a cult is all of that. So a cult is simply the unknown. Uh, everything that is not known to us, in effect, is in effect occulted, uh, obscured, unknown, etc. Uh, so, so, to me, the, the path of expanding one's uh, knowledge territory is just uh, uh, a trip into the unknown waters of occultism, uh, regardless of, of if the subject at hand is uh, occult in nature, in a sort of a traditional sense of that word. Oh, let's decline that. Apologies. Oh. Let us continue. It is the old sin of retaining the knowledge of God in the hands of a priesthood and denying it to all outside the sacred clan. I like the idea of an old sin, as opposed to these seven newfangled ones. Justifiable enough when the people were savages, but unjustifiable in the case of the modern student. Easy to agree with. For when all is said and done, the desired information can be worked out from existing literature by those who care to take the trouble or purchased plainly set forth by those who can afford high prices for books now rare. Surely the possession of ample time and ample cash should not be the test of the fitness to obtain the sacred wisdom. I would tend to agree with this, and in fact... I fancy myself a small contributor in this process. No doubt I shall expose myself to a shower of abuse from the self-constituted guardians of this knowledge who may hold that their presser secret have been betrayed. What are we to make of these positions? There is a part of me that feels manipulated when Fox Channel puts on the masked magician who reveals all, all secrets. It appeals to a 10-year-old in me because it's a magician and because the magician is breaking some sort, sort of a implied secret code. But does, that, but does such a code exist? Did it ever exist? Is it made up? Mm. 
There is no permanent record. There is no reputation even because the next big business model is kindness of strangers. We're all beggars. And so in that way, we're all a bit like Buddhist monks who are not vegetarian. Instead, they eat whatever is put in front of them in the form of charitable donations. And sometimes there's no meat. Most of the time there's no meat. And so they are vegetarians by that design, not by the design of them desiring to eat not meat. Hmm. Okay. To this I reply that I am not betraying anything that is secret, but collecting that which has already been given to the world and is of simple and well-known nature. It's a good way to mask yourself if you want to give away the farm. You, bet you betray nothing that is secret by sharing something that's already been given to the world. Once again, I find myself a next degree culprit of such things. When I first had access to certain manuscripts, I believed them to be secret and unknown to the world at large, but a wider acquaintance with occult literature has revealed to me that the information is to be found scattered broadcast through it. Love the use of the phrase scattered broadcast. Much, in fact, to which the intimate is sworn to secrecy has been published by Mathers and Wynne Westcott themselves. And as recently as 1926, a new edition of Mather's work on the Kabbalah was brought out under the editorship of his widow, who may be, who may be assumed to have known his wishes. No, this is a point I took with this text uh, first time I read it, um, the recording of which uh, I lost, um, had to redo it. Um... She could have just as easily been forced by her financial circumstances to reveal things against his wishes. So this is, I'm not sure why it suits the author more that she has revealed it through his wishes upon his death, presumably. Meh. And in that work will be found most of the tables that I give in these pages. As these catalogs of beings were originally given to the world by Isaiah, Ezekiel, and various medieval rabbis, it may justly be held that the copyright in them has lapsed owing to the passage of time. <clears throat> the idea of copyright is um, distasteful to me. Um, Largely because it is justified as a protection for the creator. And the way it's been implemented is the absolute opposite. When um, Robert Johnson met the devil at the crossroads, made a deal with the devil. This is what is meant uh, by that. It is uh, these early recordings were made in studios by people who had the recording equipment. And in order for those people to record anything, you had to uh, give away the rights to your recordings. This is, in fact, a deal with the devil. Uh, and it was done so through a kind of a um, proto-mordial, primordial, proto-primordial um, copyright uh, excuse. We'll record you if you give us the rights to your recording kind of thing. 
and then eventually the copyright ceases to be effective. Uh, different countries and different copyright laws for different things have different time periods, 50 years, 100 years, some natural passage of time. Um, it's... Um, It's distasteful to me, the whole idea of copyright. I do not abide. In any case, such ownership as there may be in these ideas is uh, vested in the original author and not in any subsequent commentator. And that author, according to the Kabbalah itself, is the archangel Metatron, the voice of God. Because our poor ears would cave in. Much that was once common knowledge has been gathered up and confined under the initiate's oath of secrecy. It is Crowley's jibe at his teachers that they bound him to secrecy with terrible oaths and then confined the Hebrew alpha, uh, alphabet to his safekeeping. Might be the reason why elders do this is not so that it wouldn't be passed on, but rather so that, that the person that's passing it on is discerning in who he passes it on to. Maybe there's something to that. The philosophy of the Kabbalah is the esotericism of the West. In it we find such a cosmogony as if as is found in the stanzas of Daizan, which were the basis of uh, May Blavatsky's work. We looked up um, Blavatsky's earlier, I thought. But she was a lady of note, for sure. Let's take a look. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. Eighteen thirty one through eighteen ninety one. So she's a 19th century lady, Russian occultist, spirit medium, and author who co-founded the uh, Theosoph Theosophical, Theosophical Society, I see, Theosophical Society in 1875. She gained an international following as the leading theoretician of theosophy, the esoteric religion that the society promoted. All right. A notable lady indeed. Um, herein she found the framework of traditional doctrine, which she expounded in her great book, The Secret Doctrine. So it could be something to look up, The Secret Doctrine. This Kabbalistic cosmogony is the Christian Gnosis. Without it, we have an incomplete system in our religion, and it, it is this incomplete system which has been the weakness of Christianity. The early fathers, in the homely metaphor, threw away the baby with the bathwater. A very cursory acquaintance with the Kabbalah serves to show that here we have the essential keys to the riddles of Scripture in general and the prophetic books in particular. Is there any good reason why initiates of the present day should put all this knowledge into a secret box and sit upon the lid? If they consider that I am wrong to give accurate information upon matters which they consider their private preserve, I reply to them, this is a free country and they are entitled to their opinion. Okay, so that brings us to the end of chapter four. I am a little disappointed with this chapter because it seems to me that Dion Fortune is still sort of waxing poetic and justifying her writing this book, which I, again, 100 years later, it's unnecessary. It's just unnecessary. So, um, I am going to read the next chapter as well. But unless things pick up, um, I will stop. To spare myself and to spare you, my dear listener. But um, you can tell me how you feel about it one way or the other. Uh, keep going or stop. Or stop. Uh, 
thumbs up or thumbs down. Uh, good night.